This is one of nature's favorite patterns, the quantum harmonic oscillator. This is the quantum mechanical version of a mass on a spring, moving back and forth around some equilibrium position as the spring stretches and compresses. Now if you look at the far right column on the screen, you'll see a quantum particle moving up and down across an equilibrium which is at the vertical center of the screen. The farther down the particle goes towards the bottom of the screen, the stronger it gets pulled back up, and the farther up it goes, the stronger it gets pulled back down. It's like a mass on a spring. But who cares? Why does this matter? <laughs> What's the point of all this? Well, if you look closely at nature, you'll find a ton of quantum mechanical springs. Nature is full of quantum mechanical springs. For example, the binding forces between atoms and molecules can be thought of as a spring-like force. Because if you think about it, you have a molecule, try to push the atoms closer together, they'll want to push back out to their equilibrium. If you want to pull the atoms apart, they'll want to pull back into that equilibrium. So that force between the atoms is sort of like a spring, but it's actually like a quantum spring. And that's what the quantum harmonic oscillator models. This model of the quantum harmonic oscillator finds ubiquitous application in chemistry and condensed matter physics. It can be used to model molecular vibrations, excitations of a crystal lattice, and many other things. It also has a nice, clean, beautiful analytic solution, which we'll see in a moment. The particle's probability density is shown by the white curve on the right side of the screen. You can see that the particle does not have a definite position, but rather is smeared out a little bit. That's just how it is at the quantum level. Behind the white curve is a colorful column that shows the phase of the particle's wave function. The phase is the angle of the wave function in the complex plane. The phase itself doesn't directly affect the probability density, right, because you square the wave function when you find the probability density, but the phase is important for other uses of the wave function, for other transformations of the wave function. For example, when you take a superposition of states, you're adding complex numbers, and so if the phases are different, you can get destructive interference. If the phases are the same, you get constructive interference. If the phases are orthogonal, you get kind of a little, little bit of both. And yeah, so that's what the, uh, the colors represent. In, in, in this whole, in all of these columns, the color represents the phase of the wave function. The columns to the left of the particle, so columns one through seven, show the stationary states that can exist for the quantum harmonic oscillator. On the far left side is the ground state, the lowest energy state that a quantum harmonic oscillator can be in, followed by the first excited state, the second excited state, and so on, up to the sixth excited state. The energy of each state is proportional to the number of nodes in its wave function and the rate at which its phase angle oscillates. For the stationary states, we see the real and imaginary components of the wave function in the blue and green curves, respectively. Behind these curves, again, we see the phase angle represented by a color, and also the opacity represents the probability density, or the amplitude squared of the wave function. This depiction is somewhat redundant, since the blue and green curves already show the whole wave function on their own, right? They show the real part and the imaginary part, that's, well, the only parts of a complex number. But I like seeing the colors too, especially because you can see how the probability densities of the stationary states do not change over time. Their phase changes, but the amplitude stays constant. So the stationary states are like standing probability waves. Here I show only the first seven stationary states, but you can imagine what the higher energy ones look like. They'll have even more nodes and the phase angles will rotate even faster, but for the most part, it's the same kind of wave. It's sort of a, a wavy wave. <laughs> what more can I say? <laughs> now, a remarkable thing is that even though the stationary states have constant probability over time, a superposition of these states will give you a wave function that moves back and forth over time. That's what the plus signs and the equal sign represent. The particle's wave function is a superposition of these stationary states. Even though the probability density of the stationary states is constant in time, their superposition, because of the interaction of the phase angles and the constructive and destructive interference, their superposition actually gives you this nice little sort of moving oscillating wave packet. Um, and this is a general theme in, uh, in quantum mechanics. Oftentimes you can represent the state of a system as a sum over a set of uh, eigenstate basis vectors, meaning that um, the time evolution of a particle can be thought of as just this, this direct linear combination of all these different standing waves. 
Of course, the particle doesn't have to be in a superposition of the seven lowest energy states. I just picked those as an example for the video. Instead, a particle could be in the ground state, or it could be in some other combination of stationary states. Anyway, it's fun to watch the pretty waves, but we'd be remiss not to look at some equations. Uh, you know, we have to structure our imagination with, uh, with mathematics in order to uh, get to the next level of imagination. So um, anyway, fortunately there are only a few equations involved with describing the harmonic oscillator, at least, you know, at a certain level of detail, and here they are. First, starting off with our Hamiltonian, which tells us the energy of the system when applied to the wave function, we notice the usual kinetic energy term, which is half the particle's momentum squared divided by its mass. Now keep in mind the momentum is a sort of this differential operator when you apply it to the wave function. Now we also see a term in the potential energy due to the spring-like force, where m is mass, omega is angular frequency, and x is the distance from equilibrium. Notice that x is squared, so any deviation from equilibrium one way or the other, positive or negative, will add to the potential energy. And this effect will grow stronger as the magnitude of x increases. Double the displacement, and the potential increases by a factor of 4. Triple the displacement, factor of 9, and so on. If this feels intuitively like a spring, it should. The potential energy of an elastic spring in classical mechanics also scales with its displacement squared. Now, Schrodinger taught us that the time derivative of the wave function is the Hamiltonian operator acting on that wave function times negative i divided by the reduced Planck's constant. Think of this as a way of saying that the energy landscape of the wave function is what guides its evolution in time. We can solve the wave function and generate a set of standing waves, which are the stationary states that we were just looking at. Here the subscript n represents the nth state. So for example, n equals zero gives you the ground state, that leftmost column in our animation. n equals one gives you the first excited state. n equals two, the second excited state. And so on, you get the picture. Now we won't go over it here, but there's a link in the description below for a derivation of these stationary states. You should go through this derivation at least once on your own, as a rite of passage, and as a good exercise in partial differential equations. By the way, here I wrote this equation with a normalized x-coordinate for algebraic simplicity, and also to highlight the characteristic length scale of these waves, which is related to the inverse of that square root m omega over h bar term. If you think about it, as m times omega becomes large relative to the reduced Planck's constant h bar, uh, the wave becomes more localized. It exhibits more classical behavior. On the other hand, as the mass and or angular frequency of the particle in the harmonic oscillator becomes small relative to the Planck scale, uh, it behaves more like a quantum system. So that makes sense. Now uh, the h sub n term is what we call the nth order physicist's Hermite polynomial. You can find a list of these polynomials on Wikipedia, link in the description below, or you can calculate them yourself using the formula shown here. I know it looks kind of complicated and esoteric, but if you take a look at the first few of these Hermite polynomials, you'll see like, okay, yeah, they're just polynomials. Nothing too special there. Um, and now finally, each standing wave has its own unique energy eigenvalue, which is the energy of that state. And it's equal to the reduced Planck's constant times omega times the order of the wave plus one half. This is a nice, beautiful, elegant solution. I really like this solution for the energy eigenstates. Um, sorry, eigenvalues, rather. Um, and note that even in the ground state, the particle's energy is non-zero. Even when n equals zero, the particle's energy is h bar omega over two. You get that zero point energy. So that's another sort of quantum result is that, you know, the ground state still has energy. Well, hey, so there you have it. That's sort of a conceptual overview of the quantum harmonic oscillator. Didn't go into too much depth, but I hope this gave you sort of a sense of the gestalt of the system. And I hope that now you have some, uh, some more intuition when people talk about quantum harmonic oscillators. Um, now you, you kind of know what they mean. Uh, anyway, hey, so if you have any questions, let me know in the comments. I'd be happy to help if I can. And finally, I'd like to end this video on a thought-provoking quote by Feynman. Nature uses only the longest threads to weave her patterns, so that each small piece of her fabric reveals the organization of the entire tapestry.